see you guys. Um, so if you weren't here last week, you're like, what are you doing? Because um, <laughs> I never do this. So if you weren't, I'd love for you to go back to YouTube, podcast. Um, if you're on radio, go find it. But Filters Part 1. Um, but today we want to continue that. So I'll, I'll get to that in just a second. This is my dad, if you don't know. Um, Dale Golden with us today. All right, before I forget, next week I start a brand new series called Greater Than Grateful. We've all heard kind of that old adage um, that gratitude is attitude, but it's actually more than that. It has to be expressed. And so we're gonna talk about in two really practical ways for the next two weeks. So Greater Than Grateful, new series, great time to invite. So that's next week. Um, But here's what we started um, last week and then I'm gonna get right into it. Basically do kind of an interview today and I'll tell you why I wanna do this. Last week we talked about the fact that everybody in life has something that's next, whether it's six months, five years, 20 years. Um, kind of a vision uh, for their future. And sometimes it's positive, like there are things you look forward to. Other times it's stuff you know you're gonna face, but you have a vision for how you wanna face it and get through it. And that could be a ton of things from new marriage to second marriage, to empty nest, to a new business deal, to like how you're gonna survive this season of parenting with your kids, We're trying to reconcile a relational thing, a new business, I mean, whatever it is. And here's what is so important that's relevant to this series and conversation is sometimes we think because we have information about the future or a vision for the future that we're actually prepared to get to that place or that vision. But the reality is that there's actually no correlation between knowing and having a vision for where you wanna go and being prepared to get there. So here's where this series comes in. The reality is that somebody is experiencing or has experienced what you're experiencing. And somebody knows what you don't know, which a lot of times we don't think. Like I've been through seasons of parenting where I'm like, I'm the only parent that's ever faced this ever, you know? And it's not true. Like somebody has experienced what I have or am experiencing. And so it's why Proverbs 13, 20 says this, Solomon, wisest dude in the world didn't take any of his own advice. He said this, Um, he said, walk with the wise and you become what? Wise, but a companion of fools suffers harm. And so literally what we talked about is that one of the primary ways, I don't think I'm overstating this, that God communicates wisdom in terms of your life and where you wanna go. And by the way, he's for you. Maybe you grew up in a church background where you don't believe that, but he's for you. One of the primary ways he communicates that wisdom is through other people in your life. And so what I wanna do in this series is just encourage you on two things, to position yourself meaning you have to actually do something for God to drop those voices into your life at just the right time. And I just tell you, God has a way of doing that. And then number two, you'd actually be willing to listen to them because all of us have got down seasons of our life and we wish we could go back and listen to the lone voice of reason and filter in the right voices and out the wrong voices. In some cases, we said last week, those voices could be the voice of God. So in my life in particular, um, the most influential voice by far has been my dad. And my whole point is not so much the relational dynamic, because I know for a lot of people, um, they don't necessarily have that. There's not multi-generational faith that's been handed down. So my point isn't so much the relationship, it is God's gonna draw somebody into your life to, to lead you and to navigate you in terms of where you wanna go and where he wants you to go but are you positioning yourself for those relationships? And then are you willing to listen? And for me, um, it's been my dad. So um, I, what I wanted to do was ask him a bunch of questions about life, handling hard stuff, thriving um, through like decades of following Jesus, and then hopefully inspire you to position yourself to lean into some voices around you. So real quick um, background. So I'm one of five kids. I'm the fourth. If I, how nervous are you about what questions I'm gonna ask off the cuff? Pretty nervous? If I can take the fifth, I'm fine. Okay, um, you, got, you can, I'm gonna force you to answer. Uh, I think the biggest question, so I, I was uh, fourth of five kids, so there's five kids, big family. Um, eight, we have gone back and forth on, you think you have 17 grandkids, but I don't feel like you're 100% sure. Well, I'll have to count them up. So, okay, 17 or somewhere around 17 and five great kids? Great, great Okay, so yeah. big family. I think the, the relevant question starting off is how did, you and mom keep it on the down low and that big a family that I was the favorite for all of those years because that had to have been hard. That had to have been hard. Well, you had to be sure that when we told one of our kids they were our favorite that none of the rest of you were around. Yeah, but... So... That's not an answer. We know. (laughs) Um, So tell... So the way I want to start is just tell a little bit about um, your journey and kind of, um, you know, growing up and, and ultimately getting married, getting married pretty young. Um, you and mom at the time kind of in a different place in terms of your faith journey. Mm-hmm. So just tell a little bit about that 
that early start, beginning to have kids, and then God kind of leading and directing your life in a different direction to kind of give some context, and we'll go from there. Okay. Uh, first of all, I had a relationship with Christ that began pretty young. Mm-hmm. I had parents that were really, uh, that loved the Lord. Um, but then uh, when I get in, got into teenage years and so on, I, I was in a church that maybe shared uh, the importance of a relationship with Christ, but didn't get a lot of growth mm-hmm. and, you know, wasn't real community. Yeah. So my wife and I started going uh, together and um, uh, she was young, I was young, but I, when we got married, she was, had not quite turned 18. <laughs> and I was, did not, was just a month or so away from being 20. Very young. Of course, we grew up where there wasn't anything to do, but might as well get married. If, you know. <laughs> Literally. <also. laughs> so, uh, but uh, she, was, uh, she was not uh, a Christian per se. Mm-hmm. Not that she, you know, she believed in God, or, you know, but not as yeah. a personal relationship. And uh, I had kind of drifted away. But then uh, uh, we had our first child 11 months after we had gotten married. And so we, you know, felt, well, we need to provide a, a right to back, mm-hmm. you know, uh, environment for yeah. our first child. And so we believe we need to be in church. That's, you know, that's going to be good for them. <laughs> that's what we brought up. So anyway, um, we began attending a church out in Cleveland, Ohio, because I had, was a, had been a machinist and then went into sales engineering. Mm-hmm. And so we were uh, transferred to Cleveland. And in the church there is where my wife realized her need to have a personal relationship with Christ. And uh, so um, uh, she, she was saved then. Mm-hmm. And then we got transferred quickly. We were in Cleveland, then we were in Rochester. Mm-hmm. And uh, it was there we began to find a church home where we began to, to grow. Yeah. And uh, so... And then uh, there was like a pivotal moment because like you had, you were doing really well in a sales position, like company car, like things, things where life was good, three kids, like very comfortable. Oh, yeah. And then there was kind of like this pivotal moment in regard to your faith. Um, yeah. So talk I, about that. Yeah. When, of course, when it, it's amazing. When I was young, uh, when I, you know, around the 12 range and so on, and I, uh, I had trusted Christ, First, I just sensed that God wanted me in ministry. Now, I don't know, you know, but then as you get into high school, um, my thoughts went over <laughs> mm-hmm. different directions. And so I kind of, that kind of uh, dimmed. Yeah. But then once, once we were married, once she accepted Christ, I began to feel that tug to my heart again of, of ministry. And, but I, I was concerned about it being my desire and not God's desire. Because, you know, you, if you, I, I was kind of afraid of my desires because you, you want to make sure that God is leading and not you. Yeah. And uh, when I was uh, traveling from Buffalo back to Rochester, I opened a verse from the Psalms that said, delight yourself in the Lord and I'll give you the desires of your heart. And that was a critical moment. I mean, it was like the light bulb, you know, lit up, like the switch. And I realized that, that if your delight is right, if you really desire to serve God, do what God wants you to do, mm-hmm. he's going to give you certain desires. He's going to plant. And I, I said, yeah. you know, th- these desires that I've been kind of shying away from were actually, I believe, that God had yeah. placed there. So I rushed home. I, I was uh, on the interstate. I'd stopped at a re- That happened at a rest stop where I w- was reading my Bible. And so when I came to that verse, I read that. It just, you know, I closed my Bible, went out of there because I wanted to get home and share that with my wife. And so uh, I, I got home and I told her, you know, I, I, in my reading and so on, I, I believe God wants me uh, in ministry. And she says, I know. <laughs> and, she, <laughs> and she felt the same way. Yeah. And so, it, uh, so then we began, okay, now what do we do? Yeah. You know, and I went to, uh, uh, I needed to talk to my pastor because I was a deacon at the time in the, in the church. And I needed to talk to him and say, hey, you know, uh, this is, what do we, what do we do now? And so 
we would, in, in that day, we went on visitation. If you have, those of you that may know back, it means you could actually knock on people's doors and they would, amp, and they would open them. Uh, so, it's a different world. <laughs> so we would go out, you know, during the week and we'd knock on doors. We hide from the folks. guy that delivers Amazon packages. So What's that? We, I said we hide from the guy that delivers yeah, Amazon packages. Yeah, I know. Packages. I, totally different. So, uh, but I, that particular, particular Thursday night, I went out with my pastor, he drove, we went out and did our uh, knocking on doors and so forth, and got back to the house, and usually if I go with him, we, we drive in, I get out of my car, get, or out of his car, get in my car and go. Well, when we got in his driveway, he just turned off the car and he turned around his seat and started talking to me, and so I realized, okay, I can't ignore this any longer, I got to tell him that, you know, what was going on in my heart, and I did. And he said, you need to prepare. You need to go to Bible school. Well, here I was. I had three kids, I think, at the time. You did. And uh, I'm thinking, huh? You know, so with three kids. But we began looking for a, a Bible school that catered to married students, and that's how, what, how we came to Florida. Yeah. With some of you, are like, well, why didn't you just do online school? Like, this is before the Internet was invented, just a yeah. few people who are not tracking yeah. with that. You had to like yeah, go somewhere. You're exactly, yeah. yeah. And it, I couldn't even Google the different schools <laughs> to find out what they were like. So I had to, to actually order for uh, their books, yeah. whatever they're called now. But, uh, and you, you have been, because um, I didn't say at the beginning, in ministry for now like 40 plus years. So yes. uh, my dad still serves on our staff um, here and uh, pastored as a lead pastor for you know 30 some years. So mm-hmm. you took incredible leaps of faith of like moving three kids down, quitting a really good job, coming to a place you didn't know, <laughs> moving into a, I don't know what you call it in language I can use on Sunday morning, but really you know bad place. And then you were able to move <laughs> to a decent home. Yeah. I mean, massive risk, massive steps of faith. Um, and it's funny because I'd always hear you tell that story and that, that verse in Psalm, um, of delight yourself in the Lord will give you the desires of your heart. And really the interpretation, which I just talked about a few weeks ago, is really that God not suppressing your desires, but transforming your desires. Yeah. And that when you're really seeking to follow, okay, God, what do you have for me? What's next in terms of my life? That it's not this, this you know, effort of like, oh, I gotta just try to do what I don't wanna do and it's gonna mm-hmm. be hell the rest of my life. It is really God transforming desires to do what God is calling you to do. And what's funny is you would tell that story for years. And then when I was wrestling with a very similar thing, like, post, you know, um, undergrad of what God had, it was that verse of mm. delight yourself in the Lord, he'll lead and, and guide the desires of your heart. Um, the question I have to fast forward way into the future, I just want to ask you one question about this before I get to the next section. Um, so you have five kids, mm-hmm. um, by God's grace, um, had five kids that trusted, followed Jesus, um, and a bunch of grandkids, same thing. What is some, what is like, I know this is really hard, but what is one thing in terms of parenting, advice specifically for getting to the place where now you have all older kids, you know, all grown, Mm -hmm. where your family like hangs out, loves being together, loves getting together for the holiday. I mean, some people are dreading Thanksgiving, Mm -hmm. you know, um, that is not the case. And I think that obviously is a byproduct of just God's grace, but also Mm -hmm. a lot of the ways that you guys parented. So I guess my question is, how did you parent toward that end? To, Mm -hmm. To lead your kids in such a way that you, as they got older, would have a good relationship with them and that your family would be close? How'd you get there? Uh, that's a big question. I know, but um, I have limited well, amount of time. Well, you be, begin with, uh, with creating environments for their own personal growth and understanding that, number one, since we're talking a little bit about parenting, there's no such thing as the perfect parent. You'll make mistakes. We made mistakes. And a lot of it was a learning, learning process. But... But we really... Do you want to talk about some of those? No. <laughs> <laughs> no, they'll be Circle forever sealed. But anyway, uh, but we were growing as parents, and you will grow as parents. You don't start out, you know, oh, you're the excellent parent. But we thought we were before we had our first child. I mean, you're the, ex- you're the expert at that mm-hmm. time. You know what you're going to do, and you know how you're going to, you know, but it all changes and I think part of it is uh, when you start out, you don't know what you don't know. And as, as you 
time goes on and you grow, you, you find out a lot of knowledge of what you don't know. Yes. Yeah. And that challenges you to, you know, to really seek to grow in that area. But we, um, we tried, I, I think the key is, I think I said consistency with your children, that's so mm-hmm. important. But I think to model model behavior for them. I mean, uh, they're going to pick up on your priorities. If God is a priority, not a priority in your life, it's not going to be a priority for Mm -hmm. them. And even, you know, I'm a firm believer that God's program for the ages is a church. And they're going to, uh, I think if you model the fact that this is a priority in your life, Mm -hmm. that's going to pick up in theirs, uh, in their lives as well. So... And I, I'll, I'll just echo that real quick because I think, um, and I've, and honestly, it's been so good. I'll call my dad sometimes. It's like, did you ever make this mistake? Just make me feel better. Um, but I, I think one of the things in terms of modeling um, that has been so incredible is that that was true for our family. And I think it's ingrained in me of like, you say a lot of words and sometimes I feel this pressure with my kids of all the things I want to teach them. And yet, as I look back, all of the things that shape our, the lives of my siblings, they would say the same thing, is what my parents modeled. Um, you know, little things like just even teaching us how to be generous. My dad would, um, one of those rare people that always had a heart for the marginalized and did it in ways that nobody knew. So I just, I just remember as a kid being loaded in the car and we'd go to help somebody that nobody knew about do some really crazy stuff, sometimes disgusting stuff, so like where my dad just always had a heart for, for kind of the least of these. And you can talk about that all day long. When you're a part of it, it does something to you to where you start to pick up on that. And one of the other things is, is in terms of generosity. I remember distinctly, um, my parents would teach it, but then you would see it. And I remember one day going into my parents when there was still like checks were a thing. And I, um, like as a little kid, looked at this check, which was like their giving check to the church. And I remember immediately getting mad because I'm like, this is why we don't have more stuff for Christmas. <laughs> so you get too much stuff away. But it was like this thing of just, ing- that has been one of the seriously like, catalytic behaviors of my life for my marriage that if I like sit down with a young couple, I, I over and over again, do this, like learn to live generous, give first, mm-hmm. save second, live on the rest. And because of my parents modeled that, I also, my dad, we grew up in a, um, you know, kind of a church environment, very different than this one. I saw my dad go through some like, anybody remember church business meetings back in the day if you grew up in that kind of, yeah, those were, those should have gone been killed a long time ago. So, <laughs> and I, I saw him tr- honestly just treated really, really badly on several occasions where my dad had to make tough decisions as a leader where you couldn't give all the information. And later on, when people got all the information, it's kind of, oh, I see that. But, but before they got there, just treated, you know, church people can be brutal. Um, and I watched my dad respond with grace and forgiveness, multiple, where I felt like, oh, I don't have that in me. Like, I just, I wanted to punch him as a 13 year old kid um, but I was small so it would have been more like a slap and run but um, <laughs> but just watching that I think that that guided and led our family um, but with that speaking of mistakes do you just want to talk real quick though about my seventh grade science project because I'm going to say this for you did a great job of encouraging us to think on our own to take responsibility um, all of that okay. this is not one of those examples no. though and I just think to make everybody feel better about themselves we should tell it so well, I had a science I'll give you the science project that I had not done anything for and if I mean some of you are going to relate this the night before and your kids like I got a science project that's due tomorrow and really I should have been working on this for three months. So we need to try to expedite the process very fast in the next couple of hours. And so my dad came to the rescue. Tell well, that story real quick. This is one of those things where <laughs> it was not good parenting. And I didn't do this to him. <laughs> I didn't do this to him at the first service. So this is brand I think new. one of the hardest things as parent is to allow your child to fail. And there are some times you've got to allow that. And so that they learned. One of the science project, it was to, it was had to do with plants. Yeah, I just wanted you know, basic, whether, you know yeah. whether the, without water, with water, and have, like we didn't know the answer. Right. Yeah. So, the night before, we we've he's got to have plants that died. He's got to. So, I helped him get some Clorox. <laughs> <laughs> kind of wilt those things yeah. a little bit. It worked. That killed those things. Yeah. And, uh, I, I tell you, I did repent of that afterwards. I, but um, and I got an A. So. Yeah, I know. <laughs> so, I got an A. Yeah, you did. <laughs> so um, yeah. 
<laughs> but in all serious, I'm not going to tell the stories because that actually, despite that story, was one of the things. I mean, probably even earlier than you were comfortable with, we're allowed to make decisions and wrestle with some stuff. I remember one in particular where I really was like a seventh grader. Hey, you make the decision, you pray about it. And what it did, which I think sometimes is very at odds with evangelical culture sometimes, if you're familiar with that term of Christian parents, that you just want to download everything. Here's, how, here's what you believe. Here's how I want you to think. And my parents somehow resisted that urge, which I think was one of the big things in terms of us owning our faith, learning how to think on our own, which we'll come back to. Um, but the other thing that I want to transition to uh, for a second is, um, I think, you know, God has blessed your, your family and your life in a significant way. Nothing's perfect, but um, I think that that's true. And yet with any life, it's not void of um, suffering and heartache and difficult times. And I think one of the big questions is through several of those seasons, how did you maintain faith on the other side of that? And just, you know, as far as background, even your dad was uh, diagnosed with cancer at 12. Mm-hmm. And it's I funny, 12, yeah. you were 12. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> um, and nobody talked about stuff then. So you found out from your brother, right? right. And he ended up passing away when you were 21. So for nine years, you just kind of carried the yeah. secret of his yeah. cancer that nobody would talk about. Yeah, well, I was told at 12, he had maybe two years left. And uh, then it didn't just, yeah, but it was carried that a, yeah. for those years. Yeah. And then um, my brother, uh, old, uh, my oldest brother, who's 27 at the time, yeah, um, your oldest son passed away, uh, had owned a large company, work accident, just freak thing, um, obviously out of nowhere. And then, you know, last several years watching um, your wife, my mom, go through the journey of Alzheimer's and pass away in 2019. So with all of that and all the ways that God's blessed your life, there's also been that suffering and heartache. And I think one of the biggest questions, because this is what all of us wrestle with, if we're in a season like that, whatever the circumstances might be, is how do you maintain faith and confidence in God despite that kind of suffering and hurt? Well, I think what is, I found essential for me is to have a solid found, doctrinal foundation of knowing who God is. Uh, because if, if you really believe that God is sovereign, you believe that God has all power. God is ever, ever present, but he's a God of love. You know, we, we are not love. We can do loving things, but God, by his character, is love. Uh, that's one of his attributes. He's, God, he's merciful and so on. So if you understand that, then the circumstances of life will not change that. Uh, and so we live in a broken world, I mean, because of... There's going, there is tragedy. And, uh, but through this, I, I began to realize sometimes we think that God is somehow being unfair to us because it happens to us. And we, uh, but if you stop and think for a moment, you know, tragedy is not new, uh, that people around the world. But it doesn't seem to be a problem for us until it hits home. Mm. Yeah. And it becomes a problem. Yeah. So did, when my, my son was killed, did I wonder why? Yeah, sure. I mean, yeah, Lord, I don't know why you're doing this. But one thing is because of my foundation, uh, doctor foundation, my why was not questioning his actions. You know, there's a difference. Yeah. You can realize that you're not, you don't have all the information and God may be doing something that you're totally unaware of because we look at things very, in a very small <laughs> uh, sphere. And so we're not seeing things as God sees them. And so I, during that time, I, as I spent time after our son was killed of, of just reviewing what I knew about God mm. and uh, spent a lot. And so and that encouraged me because I, uh, I knew that God has a plan and purpose. I'm not always privy to what it is. Yeah. And I just need to, you know, if I believe he is who he says he is, I want to trust him through it, even though I would have chosen differently. Yeah. You know, we will always would. And, and the reality is we talk about this a lot. Like any, anytime somebody walks through that, it's, it's interesting because the, the greatest influence we have or impact that people have is not by looking at somebody else's pretty packaged little life. It mm-hmm. is... Actually, the greatest impact is watching somebody else go through suffering, but then respond in mm-hmm. faith anyway, um, which is encouraging because like, you know, if you're walking through it right now, nobody is impressed by everything's great and your Instagram feed shows it. it is. You walk through really difficult times is the opportunity to be an influence more than any other time. And I think for um, 
how our family responded to that was a result of how my parents responded to that in faith and in like, and it's not, you, it was, it's tragedy. Like you mm-hmm. grieved you, all of the, like all the natural emotions, but yeah. I think it allowed us to continue to maintain faith in God and honestly gave us a blueprint for how to face things as they came forward in, a, in some ways, how to suffer by watching um, you do that. And one of the, I think the, the other questions is, and you've mentioned this before, suffering can draw you apart or it can bring you closer together. I think specifically with your relationship with, um, with mom, how did you guys navigate that season where our family, I think in a lot of ways was stronger, not weaker on the other side of it, and even you guys personally? Yeah. Well, I, what is essential is that we grieve together, not separately. Uh, sometimes people kind of, distance themselves because they're grief they're they're experiencing different things and i think that that as a couple if you're a couple you've you've got to be able to grieve together and share your heart and and you become you you strengthen one another uh, through that yeah. and and that's that's important because i've i've seen where grief has actually people have kind of separated because yeah. of it because they they make it too personal now, our grief, you know, we, we, of course, tried to be careful how, how we grieved with our kids. Yeah. We wanted them to see the, our faith yeah. that, we, you know, while it's devastating, it's not, you know, it's, everything's not over because of that. Yeah. And uh, so. Yeah. The, uh, the follow-up question to that, and this is what we had, a, um, we call these ideation meetings where we talked through some of this stuff with a whole, mm-hmm. with a team of people. And one of the questions that came up by multiple people when we were kind of discussing some of this was, so then after that, sometimes the, the trauma of that can just leave you, honestly, living the rest of your life. Mm-hmm. We are kind of always afraid of what, like how, I guess the question is, how do you not then live in fear and be debilitated mm-hmm. by fear or debilitated by that trauma mm-hmm. um, moving forward? Wow. Well, it, again, uh, you realize that life is temporal. I mean, that we're going to, it's not all over. If, we, if we're afraid of what's going to happen, you know, we're going to rob ourselves of the joy that we can experience going forward. Um, you, you know, there was a time, you know, after it happens, uh, I believe God gives you a numbness. It, it, it worked, mm-hmm. it worked. Uh, in our situation is that it it almost seems unreal you know and uh, I w- probably felt that for a while f- yeah. and uh, until you know all at once you know I realized that we, we, our focus of our attention had to be not lamenting on what we lost a lot lamenting on what we're going to lose out on in the future but begin to focus on what we had and what God had given us. Mm. And that becomes great memories. Mm. And, and so I'd rather spend time thinking about tho- those times rather than just uh, thinking about, you know, we're not going to do this, we're yeah. not going to do that. And I think that sometimes can, where some bitterness can come in yeah. because you, uh, that's all you're- Become hyper-focused yeah, on that. Yeah, hyper-focused on yeah. that. I don't know if you already said this already. So if I did, if you did and I blanked out, um, <laughs> we'll edit it. Um, I'm glad you said But I, I remember distinctly one time just asking you the question of the whole, just why, why me? Did you answer this already? And, and your answer to that I thought was in, incredibly profound of just, because so many of us land there. Like mm-hmm. you go through that, it's just so difficult. Why, why, why me? Why, why am I walking through this? Mm-hmm. Well, I... I said after we, especially after my son, and even during the time after my wife died, um, began to focus on, on God, who he is, and, and so forth, and, and realized we live in a world that's broken. And there is tragedy, and there will be tragedy till Christ comes. Mm-hmm. And so I realized that you can get so upset about what you're now experiencing, and maybe, you know, why God, why, mm-hmm. why me? But we don't ask that question when it's other people, people we don't know that are experiencing tragedy every day. And so I finally realized, and I thought, well, maybe sometime I ought to write something like this, is why not me? Hmm. Why, why would I be different than other people if that's what God chose yeah. uh, to take us through? Yeah. And, and so... 
including all throughout the scripture. Like there's nobody. Yeah. Well, yeah, I, even, I figured even the disciples, yeah. things didn't end well for yeah. them. Yeah. And so, yeah. so yeah. who are we? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So it thinking God was Peter. okay with yeah. them, but not with us. Yeah. <laughs> um, tell, I want to land on kind of one other question that's somewhat tied, and then I want to end with a few other things. But um, tell, what are a couple of the things that you think kind of built your faith or once you, specifically as you got older, that, because over and over again, I think that's one of the things that I picked up for you. I think other siblings, same thing. In fact, what my top thing on my prayer journal every day is err on the side of bold faith. Just mm-hmm. live believing God can, asking if he's willing, mm-hmm. which is what you see. In the news. And I just feel like over and over again, to crazy steps of faith, whether it was packing up a family and leaving everything. To, how did you develop the courage to take those steps of faith that built over years? And then how did you, and I don't even know what your answer would be to this, how do you feel like you were intentional in passing that off? Just that kind of legacy of living by faith. Mm-hmm. Wow, that's a lot. Well, <laughs> well um, I, I think early I had, uh, in my faith walk, I had to uh, privilege of having a, a, a strong pastor that was mm-hmm. very uh, doctrinal and and I uh, early developed a you know uh, a real trust in who God is and and mm-hmm. and so on and so but I also think that experiences you have along the way help to build your faith if you walk through one maybe it's not a big thing but yeah. you walk through that and you see how God took you through that, that prepares you for the next, next step. step. And I, yeah. I often said, you know, when Abraham offered Isaac, that did not happen in the beginning of his life. It happened in the latter part of his life. And mm. so he had a lot of experience that helped to build his faith. Yeah. So uh, it's, it's just a building process. Uh, you know, we've had a lot through the years that have happened and. uh uh, nephews that were, were killed and you know we for some reason uh, but walking through those God gives you strength yeah. you know so it just has kind of built it one builds. on another yeah, yeah. Um, how, like how do you think you have and I, I, I have one example I can think of how, how have you kind of like used some of that because I think it's one like in fact in the Old Testament talks about this of passing on those mm. stories of faith to the next generation how, like, how do you think you were intentional about that with us in terms of, of parenting? I think the por- important thing for me is demonstrate as best you can. You can, words are good, but if you don't back up your words, mm-hmm. then uh, I think that has, can have a negative impact. Yeah. But we tried to help you too. Um, children, you know, it, it's great when they trust Christ young. But you have to understand that a lot of the, their faith has been built up on their parents, yeah. what they receive from their parents. And there has to be a point in their life where it becomes personal. Mm-hmm. And so you have to allow your children to question and not be shocked. But they come say, I'm not sure I believe this. Uh, you know, you got to allow them the opportunity to investigate so that they come to the place where it now is real for them yeah. uh, rather than being, well, that's what my mom and or And I think dad even said. involving us and stuff, I remember big decisions sometimes where as we got older, I mean, not yeah. inappropriately, but it was praying together, you know, especially my, uh, with Heather, uh, my younger sister, involved in some of those things, but it really taught us about faith and taking steps of faith and mm-hmm. what that looked like. Um, and the other thing that I was going to say um, on that as well I, I really don't remember. So here's the other, there was, here, so here's my next question. I think it's a big question. It was something. But um, so this is the question as we were sitting down with like multiple people, this question came up over and over again. And specifically, because we had several staff members there and we have, uh, you know, a lot of younger staff and over and over again, they would make mention like, man, my, and I won't mention names or anything, but my, my grandfather just feels like just as checked out of life. Like they, I mean, just not really engaged at all. And really, it was said as a compliment to you of, of now you just turned 77. Um, how have you stayed um, purposeful? I mean, you are like have more energy than ever. Um, <laughs> you serve part-time on our staff. Obviously your role has changed, but how do you continue to thrive? Realize I have purpose by my life. And I mean, you live that. I mean, in fact, I just, side note, my dad just hours ago got back from a cruise with all of these 
famous jazz musicians that somehow he got to know. Um, and so he did a whole VIP cruise for a week. So <laughs> he's, he's enjoying himself. Um, but how, how do you get to that place where you don't just, just check, check it out, you know? Um, well, understanding that God places you on this earth for a certain amount of time. And uh, our purpose has to be, we, we seek to find his purpose. We don't bring, we don't uh, try to get God to approve our agenda. Mm. We try to, you know, seek what is his agenda for me? What does he want? And so I, I figure as long as we have the ability, capability, we're, we should do what we can. We should serve until God decides, you know, that's it. That's yeah. your, that's your life. Yeah. And, um, so. And one of the things you would ingrain, I mean, years and years and years ago, for whatever reason you would say, like, my goal is not to retire, yeah. which in a, in a culture where it's like, how can I just play golf and whatever? Yeah. And you just made, not again, that your role hasn't changed because it has, I mean, you're mm -hmm. doing different things now mm -hmm. than you did 20 years ago, but yeah. really ingraining, which I picked up on that, like, you know, I, not that you're not, um, responsible in terms of the future, but like the whole goal is not to yeah. retire and die. Yeah. That's because I couldn't play golf, but, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, you had no other options, but I had, uh, you talk about listen, having people in your ear. Yeah. I remember one of my, um, uh, the president of the, of the uh, college, which mm -hmm. I went to and had a sit down with him and he made the statement. He said, few finish well. And that hit me because as you get older, it is easy to check out. Yeah. But my, I, my prayer for a number of years now is, Lord, help me to finish well. And I think if you're going to finish well, you're going to, okay, you know, it may change what I can do, but what can I do yeah. uh, so good. to serve? Um, I think two more. I, I, but I don't want to pass by this. What You're married uh, when... When mom went to heaven, 52 years, I was almost right at 53 years. Mm -hmm. um, I, I would be dumb not to ask this question. What, like, what is one key advice in terms of, and again, I, all my siblings get up there and talk about this. You had a great marriage for mm -hmm. all of those years. So that you finished well with it. Like what's, give me one or two things in terms of just relationships, marriage advice. Well, quickly, I would say number one is communicate, talk. Our favorite thing to do was to talk. We get up in the morning, get the coffee, and just spend time talking to one another. Many times mm -hmm. at night as well. Uh, and another thing is laugh. You need, you know, uh, you need to like one another. You know, you know, you can love someone like you love your kids, right? Sometimes you don't like them, <laughs> but I there, are, there are moments, Amen. but you don't stop loving them. <laughs> Amen. But, uh, I don't like you know, two of mine right now. You have to. <laughs> <laughs> Love them, though. Yeah. Love well, you, them. You have, you know, and, and understand at the whatever time, there's a time that will come when your kids will leave home. Mm -hmm. And if, sometimes I've seen parents that their whole life is into their kids, they, you know, and they neglect one another. And what happens is that when the time comes, the kids leave, and the parents look at one another, and they like they're strangers. What do we do now? Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, while you love your kids dearly, you have to maintain that close relationship with one another because that's what goes on. After your kids are gone, you're still going to be together. Mm -hmm. So you better know how to you know, relate to one another. Yeah. yeah, if it's, if you're going to be That's able to good. continue. I'm going to give you uh, one more. And I don't know if maybe, I don't know if even this is a different answer, but what, uh, so I'm just going to say this for you. So sort of talking about thriving and having purpose. I mean, you, I know regularly, nobody would know this, have 20 somethings in your home that you mentor. Um, you are a surrogate father to a bunch of people, um, some of which even on our staff, like you, incredible example of like, for me, even a North Star of this is how you move into those seasons and still continue. I think you're having more influence than ever before, honestly. But what, what thing, somebody else asked this question on staff, that was a really big thing, maybe early in your life, that's not as big anymore, or maybe another way to ask it is, what advice would you give 25-year-old you? Mm. Wow, that is a big question. Um, you know, I, I think when you're young, 
things are black and white, you, you, you develop a set of this, 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 this. And then as you get older, you realize some of those things that you think are so important that, um, especially in relation to other things, when you go through difficult experiences, you realize, you know, I, that's not what's important. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I, think I'm, I, I think of my oldest son, and we were trying to really bring them up, you know, the best we could. And, and in his high school years, that was when boat shoes were popular without socks. Is that like boat shoes? And, is that like Z Cavaricis? And anybody remember? I don't know. But they call boat shoes. Okay. They look like a loafer type of thing, but didn't wear socks. And that, that was a big thing. You can't go to church without socks. You know, your feet. And... Uh, so I, re- I realized later on, that was really, I made a big issue out of nothing. Yeah. And uh, there's more important things than going without socks. So I, I think I, I would tell young parents, pick, you know, pick and choose of what's, and develop some good priorities and realize, allow your kids to be kids. And that's part of making some decisions on their own. Yeah. You've got to prepare kids that when they leave your nest that they're prepared to make decisions Mm -hmm. so you start young by letting them make decisions that are not going to be earth shattering and you know uh and they'll learn how to make good decisions and they'll learn how to make bad decisions yeah uh but that's part of preparing them To and I would say that happened over and over again. And I had, in the environment that we grew up in, I, I would watch other kids with their parents and kind of church culture. And I just, there was almost like they could never make any decisions. And uh, there's such this hyper, like, I want them to just own my faith, think the way I do, be like me. All, and again, somehow you avoided that. And I think one of the things I'm most grateful for is because, you know, it's been so easy with my dad, even in terms of like not agree. Now we agree on most stuff, but mm-hmm. there's things we haven't agreed on or it's such an incredible relationship as I got older where we would have, I mean, we'd have not heated discussions, but we could just disagree yeah. on stuff. And I, you know, my dad's my best friend. And so they modeled like, own your faith. It's okay to think differently than me. It's so, and, and I, that was an incredible, incredible gift. And even the ability to make decisions. And as we got older, feel like no matter what, you somehow took off your pastor hat and you were just, you guys were our parents, even if you didn't agree with all of our decisions, which is why I think, you know, we're close at this age. So I just, I want to say this. I didn't say the first service. Um, Everything God's done in our church, um, all the ways he's reaching people, it just wouldn't be possible without my dad. And the scripture is really clear. You stand on the shoulders of, of other people. And so everything God's doing is because of his faithfulness and even his willingness to hand off the baton of leadership way early um, and empower other people. And so I just want to acknowledge that, like um, what God's done. Thank you. And the last thing I want to end with is my whole goal in this, again, was not so much the relationship. It was positioning yourself and then being willing to listen where God drops people into your life. For me, I am extraordinarily blessed that those people happen to be my parents, along with other people and the other mentors and people that God's brought into my life every step of the season. But I've, I've always had that. In fact, I was doing a talk with our staff a while ago, and I said, I think in a lot of ways, like I feel, I feel like life has been unfair, not on the negative side, but on the positive side of like just grandparents and grandparents, great-grandparents and parents of of multi-generational faith to where I feel like I, I couldn't have asked for more. And I understand that's rare, but it has shaped every part of my life, marriage, parenting, God's will for my life, everything I've done. But what I wanna say to you, because for some of you, you're caught up in the opposite. Maybe it's multi-generational dysfunction in some ways, or it's, you know, things are not ideal, which is the world that we live in. And so my one encouragement for you would be somebody in a multi-generational line has to go first to go, why not me? Why not now? Why don't I begin to sow in a different direction? Because you don't get to a place at 77 to have joy and contentment and feel like you're living with purpose. You, you, you sow your way there and then eventually you reap it. But why not you? 
And why, no matter what your multi-generational stuff has been, you have the opportunity through God's spirit and God's power to begin to change the tide of that and sow in a different direction. That so maybe 10, 20 years from now, like there's a different, like your family tree has been rearranged in some ways. And so what I wanna encourage you to do is, is two things. The first one is you have to position yourself for this. And for most people, I, I think for all of us, but you mentioned it, like the local church is at the heart of this. And I have... I have tried to embed this as much as I can as your pastor, if you consider me that, and those of you on radio or wherever you are, but you have got to take a step to get into community, get into community group. And the whole like lame excuse, well, I tried that once, that doesn't work in any other area of life. So what, you tried that once. (laughs) Try it again and try it for the 17th time until you get it right. And you need to volunteer somewhere and give your life serving other people in the context of local church because it's not just about you and God's gonna use that and you're gonna be a part of God's will and reaching a city and reaching a community, but it's even more than that. God's going to drop strategic voices and relationships into your life just when you need them to lead you to where he wants you in terms of your future. So I, I get that it's gonna require rearranging and killing three things that you're doing that you probably shouldn't be doing anyway and centering your life around really, hey, is, is this really what I want so you don't get two decades down the road and go, I wish I would have prioritized some different things. So I just wanna encourage you, take a step, get in, be involved in your local church. Cause I think that's where generally it happens the most because a lot, you'll find people who have the same vision for your future as you do and you need their help because they've been where you've been and they've experienced what you experienced. And the second thing is, which is the whole point of the series, be willing to lean in and listen to their voice because all of us have looked back at seasons when there was that lone voice of reason that we tuned out And now we wish with everything we could go back and tune that voice in because it wasn't just about the person. In some ways, you look back at seasons of your life and you feel like that was the voice of God. And so I cannot stress that enough. And I'm hoping a bunch of you um, would just take a step to position yourself and then be willing to listen. And so with that, would you just pray over everybody like on the edge of like navigating a decision, next season of their life, whatever it is, and just really praying for wisdom. Father, we're so thankful for your love for us, so thankful for your grace, your mercy. Lord, we're thankful that as Christ followers, we're never alone, and that we have available to us by your Spirit the very wisdom of God. Lord, I know that the folks represented here, uh, Lord, are in different stages of their life, having different experiences. But Lord, I pray that they will lean in, first of all, to you, And Lord, allow you to give direction and guidance in your life. But Lord, sometimes we need to seek those around us, those whom we trust, those whom we've witnessed that have a a walk of faith and be able to, to lean in and glean from their wisdom and to seek, Lord, to live lives that will be uplifting, lives that will bring joy and peace in their lives. So, Lord, thank you again for our our time together. We'll give you praise, Lord, in Christ's name. Amen. 